welcome everyone directly from Kingston, Jamaica, Steely and Cleavy. Legends, legends. Uh, you gentlemen have known each other for a long time, I understand. Yeah, our friendship goes back to, wow, early 70s. You know, just about 1970, I met Steve. Um, he, just, he had just started playing keyboards at the time. I was just learning drums. And we found out we had similar tastes for music. You know, the songs I liked, he liked the same songs. <laughs> And we just started jamming together every day. We went in, like, had a room where I had my old battered drum kit and um, a little keyboard. And we just jammed together, but we did not know then that we would have ended up having um, a production team. And um, we were invited to play on a recording, our first recording ever, um, uh, invited by Augustus Pablo to play on a Hugh Mundell session and um, some songs with a singer then called Earl 16. Yes. So we both played on our very first recording together with other musicians as well. But then um, as time went by, we branched off. Um, Steely was invited to work with um, Gregory Isaacs and Roots Radix Band. Mm -hmm. I became a member of the in crowd. Yeah, band. Yeah. And we sort of split then mm -hmm. and went off various ways. So but, you actually started working when you were maybe, what, 10, 12 years yeah, old, yes, is yes, that right? Yeah, right. Well, during the, the Hugh Mundell session uh, with Augustus Pablo, uh, what age were you at that time, <laughs> if I may ask? I was 14. 14. Um, 14. I was 11. 11. Yes. <laughs> 11 and 14, and <laughs> Hugh, Hugh Mundell, uh, mm. legendary singer, was only a youth himself. Yeah, he was very young. Yeah. Yeah, he was Not sure how old, but he was very young as well. Very young. And though those sessions that uh, they worked on went on to become one of the most legendary uh, Roots reggae albums, uh, Africa Must Be Free by 1983, yes. Hugh Mundell with uh, uh, Augustus Pablo producing most of it. Uh, yes. So Steely then went on to work with the Roots Radix. And the Roots Radix are absolutely one of the fundamental bands. Yeah, actually I have the, um, the track here, the Human Del. Oh, okay. Who's right. going to play the Human Del? <laughs> yeah. I was 11 and Cleaver was 14, playing drums. I was playing keyboard. Uh, wow, 11 and 14 <laughs> creating history there. Now, I understand that you started out playing the tuba. Originally, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's what How did I you know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, yeah, I learned bass clef. Then I had um, a liking for bass. You know, so sometimes we, we share ideas with regards to bass line and so. But steel essentially plays most of the steel and cleaver basses, synthesizer basses. But as a, as you got into drums, yeah, um, I realized that was what I really liked. Mm -hmm. Drums. But tuba, I mean, I learned music formally from playing the tuba. You know, I went on to do other music forms. I did choral music, you know, um, jazz, everything. It's like Jamaica is like a melting pot of different um, vibes from you know, different parts of the world. We get a little of everything. Yeah. It's a multiracial country. I mean, you have Indians from India living there, Chinese, all sorts of people. So there's a lot of influence, you know, the music is really wide. There is a lot of um, traditional, the residue of African music there. You have Eto and Kumina and things like that, that we also um, are influenced by. Mm -hmm. And what, what was the progression from Mento uh, to the more what we know of as, you know, ska, rock steady into to reggae. Was it, what, what year was, you know, what years are we talking about there? What time period that Mento progressed to what we know of as reggae? Well, the Mento, um, I think it's, it, it went to... Um, In the 50s, you know? The, um, um, early 60s. And fade away. I think Scare came in at, um, at 63, 64. Mm -hmm. 
It was a very long time. Mm -hmm. From ska to rock steady, you know, rock steady to reggae, reggae, Into dance, style. dance style. Mm -hmm. Actually, the same form of music, it just, that it, um, we call it evolved to something else. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I, I still have some regrets <laughs> in that, um, some of the, the styles that we have progressed through throughout the years could have remained <coughs> as a style on its own. Mm. You know, I, I think like um, ska could still be, um, it could evolve as ska itself, as a separate entity. You know, mm -hmm. but it evolved into reggae and then we did away with ska in Jamaica. I mean, I see it still as a strong music force. Mm -hmm. And um, reggae into dancehall, we still have reggae and dancehall, you know, but all the different um, forms that we went through could have still progressed on its own. Well, it's been a, a theme in your work uh, that the two of you have done uh, respect for the older uh, songs, and I think it's, it seems, is that something that you've uh, explicitly tried to do, is, you know, bring back some of the older rhythms? Yes, um, <laughs> as I say, the history goes on, and um, at times progress on, things change, and the younger generation will always go so far that they might lose what is there before. So we try to keep them abreast with what, what was there before. That's why at times we, went, we go back and make things that were there into modern time, just to remind them, to keep them mm. abreast with what, what they have before. Mm -hmm. Because we, you can keep evolving and evolving until you lost everything. I, I find a problem in Jamaica with archiving, for instance. Um, many of the old great songs, I don't believe they are being um, preserved. You know, and um, there were great songs. So we make an effort to re-record them and um, present them to a new generation. And we plan to preserve those songs. You know, um, not just with music, with old television clips and things like that. I think mainly due to budgetary constraints, the television stations had people like Miss Lou, um, Louise Bennett. Um, she had a program then that we found out that many of the tapes were reused. They re-recorded over the tapes. That's history lost, won't come back. You know, and we really believe that um, we should make the music available and um, the history kept alive. Um, there's a song that we recorded, we recorded, that was one of our favorite studio one songs, um, produced by Sir Cox and Dad, called No, No, No. With a sample of Uroy in there? Yes, yes. Wake the town and tell the yeah, people. He was the first DJ that came in Jamaica. Uroy? Yes. Yeah. And many of our um, current DJs, they don't know the history. Mm -hmm. you know? So we present these artists and some of the things. And you know, when they hear it, they say, hey, Steely or Cleave, who that? How come you never use me? You know? So we tell them who Uroy was, you know, keeping the history alive. Right, right, and you know, a lot of the a lot of the Jamaican DJs, and for maybe some people might not be familiar with the terminology, a DJ in Jamaica is the person, you know, holds the microphone and and speaks. Uh, so a lot of the Jamaican DJs actually influence American rap music in the early days. You know, uh, people like you, Roy, but. To go back to the track that we just heard, uh, Dom Penn, No, 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 that was part, that came from an album uh, where, Cleaver plays studio on where you play the Studio One. And Studio One was, uh, for those who don't know, was a um, legendary studio, a recording studio in Jamaica, originated, or maybe they didn't originate, I'm learning from, <laughs> from Steely today. Uh, some of the uh, classic rhythms that are still used yeah, today. From Joe Creed. Yeah. Uh, so, an, Treasure a, Isle? Yeah, there was, a, there was another producer in Jamaica named Joe Creed. He was the first, um, kind of on the low, 
Sir Coxon was the one that was always in your face. But majority of the track came from Joe Creed. We, um, we have a, also have a, another track there from Joe Creed that we did over. Joe Creed, and Treasure all of, Island. And all of this track was done with computer, um, drum machine, not live. We try to get the computer music to sound as live as ever. So we do a lot of swatting, copying. So, you know, so. Mr. DC uh, rhythm uh, was that rhythm I first heard with uh, Sugar Minot, a uh, tune called Mr. DC that was on Studio One. Yeah. Now, do but you think that, Duke Reed did, did that one originally? You know, what that originally is a song from the state, from America. It was originally done by a singer called Johnny Taylor. Johnny Taylor, yeah. Ain't That Loving You. It was a cover version of an American song. We were, we were speaking earlier about the influence that uh, some uh, American R&B soul groups had uh, on Jamaica music, like, um, you know, Impressions and the vocal uh, trio groups. Yeah, they, uh, they influenced uh, the Whalers amongst yeah, that others. Yeah, that is a classic example um, of the influence um, on our music. Um, Jamaica, the location of Jamaica, we get um, music from the U.S. more than any other country, but we get just the songs that were great songs. You know, so we don't have to sift through a number of songs or whatever. And those artists did influence like, groups like the Whalers, and so the impressions, you know, um, we found groups being formed over time. Even vocal styles, I think, were influenced by American artists. One thing that is uh, maybe unique in uh, Jamaican music is the way that rhythms are used again and again. Uh, you know, a, a rhythm, a musical backing track can be made and can be voiced with dozens um, of different vocalists on the same uh, rhythm track. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you all have uh, obviously originated or uh, made, played the music for so many uh, of these rhythm tracks. Uh, do you have anything to do with the voicing of those tracks or is it something where you just play the music and then you don't know who's going to voice on the track? <laughs> Well, it started long before our time. <laughs> Actually, starts from 50s, 60s. Um, same DJ, you right, I right, and um, Big Youth. They all used to go on the same rhythm track. Many different artists. I think it's as a result of demand from um, the, the public too. The sound systems used to mix from one song to the other, you know, and um, we all wanted the same rhythm. There was a rhythm track, for instance, a song called Satamasa Ghana that had about 20 different <laughs> <laughs> songs. So uh, it goes uh, back to the 60s. Uh, it's uh, not Stagalag, a new phenomenon. This one. Stagalag again yes. had. Oh, this one, this one. You have okay. it. I would praise the old. What do you um, say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all credit from dance hall um, in the early days, sound system, what we call clash and competition of who is the champion. And it, it is um, it's like, which sound can play a different version yeah, of the same rhythm, rhythm than the other sound? Usually come with different vocal. So that's where it came from. I have more than one artist on the same track. It was all starting a competition. And the sound systems were directly related to record labels? At that time? Yes, Sir Cox number one. And Duke Creed. Duke Creed one. So maybe uh, if Treasure Isle, Duke Creed Sound came with a song one week that was popular, uh, would uh, Coxon go into the studio that week and same, try and cut? Same some, time. <laughs> same time. <laughs> he would go in and try and cut his version. Yeah, I so the same track. When the dance came, they would. Uh, try and have a, a harder version of the same right. rhythm. Yeah. So the whole culture was born out of competition, a healthy competition. And it's the same today with you know, um, the music. It's competition, basically. But um, the, the, the reggae music go, go far, very far, very deep. 
it's not just only music, it's, it is a vibe, a spirit. Um, Leaf Perry Scratch is one of our great producers. I can remember as a kid playing inside the studio. <laughs> Keeper came, came in with a dove, released the dove in the studio while you record. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Crazy thing. Yeah, that was bouncing into the mics and you know, <laughs> hitting the cymbals. Yeah, quite interesting. <laughs> but we can't say that about genius. I mean, yeah. what he did with that song was phenomenal. I mean, you, you, you couldn't tell, listening to the record, what made the sounds. But, you know, you would probably sample a cow. Uh, the, you know, that trap there. Yeah, yeah. Try you know, to cow find in the studio. You know, no, take a cow into the studio. <laughs> a cow yes. yeah. into the studio. Yeah. I mean, you didn't have samplers those days. So you have to actually record the thing. If you need a bike, well, you take a bike into the studio and rev the bike. Right. Yeah. yeah. The a big uh, Dillinger record with Big U. Yeah, yeah you have to actually the... take the thing and I mic it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> So uh, uh, Scratch was bringing uh, cows and yeah, other doves, doves all sorts of animals, a menagerie. In the yes. I'd worked on an album with him sometime. One day the drum kit was OK. The following day I went in and there was yellow paint all over the drum kit. The cymbals was painted with paint. The keyboards, everything was yellow, the entire studio. And um, what he did with the sound <laughs> again, I mean, he, Process the sound. He knew what he wanted. This was a, this no. was the song. This was the song with the cow, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, Jamaica is a small country, a little island, and we have to be very creative there. <laughs> Create our own sample. It's just music. One one major advantage I would say Steve and Cleve mm -hmm. have is um. The fact that we started quite young, we were there on a lot of those sessions. So if we need to remake the music, it's <coughs> difficult to remake it without capturing the, 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 the spirit of the time. You know, you have to understand the, what Jamaica went through, you know, different times in Jamaica's history. And we can go back, we have to take ourselves back and recapture the spirit of the time. Mm. You know. There were times when you had, um, you know, violence, up, you know, and serious times when the music sounded really hard and serious. There were happy times in our history, you know, and we can see the time period. Just listening to the music, we, we see the time, we feel the time. You know, this Bob Marley song is one that, as Cleve was saying, the time, I think this is one of his times when he was very sad. And his first set of recording was this. Yeah, early Bob Marley. Yes, sad days. <laughs> hmm. So when, when you speak about uh, recreating, you know, uh, the, the feeling and how important that is to, to making the authentic music, how do, you, how do you go about doing that in this, this time when, you know, you're in a, people are using computers, et cetera, not bringing cows into the studio <laughs> and painting things yellow. Um, well, it's... Um, technology allows us to get technology, technology, get technology is there, but I mean, as people, there are certain information that will stay within one, that don't, doesn't go away, stay there. I mean, it doesn't matter where I am, where I go, I will always be a Jamaican. It is something, it's a spirit that you brought upon. And um, I mean, if I could play something now, just anything, like, like, like playing a reggae ska, it, the feel will be, st it will be the same. I will play. you cannot change that right always be there so it's easy to make it back you see the important thing is to be there and know what it was like we um, also experienced analog we experienced old microphones you know and 
we know now what exists. And um, sometimes you don't always get it right if you can't get back the same equipment, but you know the sound. It's in your head, it's in your being. <laughs> and it might take some searching, but you can find something close. I, might, I mean, <laughs> we actually go inside um, a bathroom and take a, a, a tidy tissue and go. I make a snare. <laughs> I'll make a or kick drum, drum or whatever. Or something. You know, it's, it's, it's there, it's music. And I mean, music speak one language. We already understand that, speak one language. A C will always be a C, <laughs> no matter what language it mm -hmm. always be. Mm -hmm. And you, it doesn't matter what language you speak, you will always hear the melody as the melody. Yeah. Cannot change. You can only get out of a computer what you put in. Mm. Yeah. Hope you get it back, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. So it, it, it was very interesting to me to learn that you all were one of the first users of uh, Pro Tools back before a lot of people knew what it was <laughs> even, surprisingly. Uh, in the late 80s, you yes, were using... Uh, it was 8.6. 8.6? Um, um, <laughs> yeah, um, system. Uh, operative system. The Mac operating system, yeah. yeah. Before it went to 09, it was 8.6. Um, I tell you, like, when we started using drum machines and computers, we got a lot of bad reviews. You know, nobody in Jamaica thought that this would ever work mm. with reggae music. But we proved them wrong, because um, when we started, <coughs> it was so new to the kids that just were able to afford to buy records. We found that at the end of the year we started out, we amassed a total of about 75% of the songs on the top 100 charts in Jamaica. Amazing. It was a massive transition from what was happening before. The people were waiting for something new, and I think we delivered that to them. So you, you all were there for really uh a most important landmark in Jamaica music and to me like music in general which was around you can tell us more exactly but I think 85 or so when uh, the digital rhythms really started replacing yes. the, the band rhythms and one of the people you were working with uh, Bobby Dixon who goes by the name Bobby Digital and King Jammy and King, at King Jammy studio yeah I wonder if you could uh, tell us something about that, that time and how I mean, th that the change time happened. It was just a little studio and we had an um, uh, eight track recording machine and no, four track. So I had to um, play live for there was no sequence. I had to play live. I mean, I played the drum and the bass together, but all the dubs on had to be live. like. Uh, you saw the play. You play that all for four minutes straight. It's be your own sequence. Right? And then... You have to play live, 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 live. Because there was no sequence, no MIDI. I don't stand. But coming out of um, the old school where we actually played instruments, it wasn't that difficult. You know, today you find um, musicians that are producers that um, didn't go to the formal thing where you actually played on live shows and things. We did a lot of tours where we had to be on stage, like sometimes up to two hours, you know, and um, it, that strengthened us and prepared us for doing that until sequences and so came in, then that was a bit of help. But also, um, I think for economical reasons, we found that a lot of producers gravitated towards um, drum machines, because on the live sessions, I would sit uh, channel one around the drum kit, uh, an hour kicking the bass drum, trying to get a sound, you know? Snare, another hour on the snare. You know, we were so meticulous about the sound and um, so many producers were using the studio that everything was pulled back down, you know, and I suppose those are means of making money for the studio as well. The same drum kit was there, but they pulled it back down. 
You know, so you have to go in and spend hours getting the sound. So when we brought drum machines to the studio, the producers were happy. Mm -hmm. it took much less time doing the sessions. But originally, as I understand it, the, the first digital beats were uh, just on a keyboard. Is that, is that true, the uh, slang tang rhythm? No, that's, that's a wrong. That's okay. A wrong. <laughs> the first digital start by Bob Marley. Bob Marley. So Bob Jackson. Marley made the first computer music in Jamaica. Tell us about that. It's a song they call So Just Say. It was a rhythm Sorry, box. Don't have it here. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a drum machine made from Roland. It was a rhythm box. He first and Lee Perry Scratch, they first started it in the so, 70s. So Just Say, uh, yeah. Bob Marley. Yeah, and, and Billie Jean Shined. Right. Yes, the whole computer started right. from the Whalers, 1973. And those are the songs that made me aware that there was something new happening. And I started searching to find out what was this creating I mean, that sound. We spent a lot of time with Baba Skid. I mean, we spent hours with him, watching him writing, singing, late night, and um, watching how he created his music. There's a lot, we have a lot of history. We spent a lot of time at Sir Cox as well, going to school. We used to leave school, run to the studio. Look, watch a great musician playing. And just there, I was there with it. I mean, we grew up with the music, always close to it. Who are some of the musicians uh, that you were watching back then? Like um, Jackie Mito, Ron Alfonso, Tama McCook, a bass man called Lyde Brevet, Jackie Jackson, Lyde Nibs, Dan um, Danjaman Jr. Um, Johnny Moore, Ernie Wrangling, Ernie Wrangling. That's great jazz player, great, great musicians. And Earl Wild Lindo, um, the old yeah. Whalers band. And so before they even became the Whalers, I mean, he used to be on sessions, sitting on sessions and watch. You know, and um, we were allowed to. I mean, uh, I'm happy for that, that they didn't throw us out of the studio. Yeah. But as kids, we were always interested. And we'd mm -hmm. go by the studio and sit I remember Lee Perry Scratch put us one day to sat on a couch like this and say, look at Scratch on the TV. I was looking and say, huh? This man crazy. Say, <laughs> there was a static on the screen. Say, look at Scratch on the TV. I was looking. And he went with a nail and go like this on the, on the screen. <laughs> scratch on the TV. <laughs> it was Some people crazy. thought he was crazy, but he's an eccentric character. <laughs> But somehow that got the vibe. Yes. That got the vibe going. Because I just love music. In reggae, it's just I love music. The Caribbean Sea, the weather, traffic. I mean, it's just a vibes, a free spirit. And that just express itself. It's all nature. That is reggae, really. It is not a, a violent music, it's a love music, really. It has a lot of hardship, everything. <coughs> mixed together, but it's, most of it is really a love music. How did you all begin to work with King Jammy, and when was that? <laughs> well, first I used to play with Ruth Felix, Ruth Felix band, um, Greg Isaac. Um, I mean, those days I was a session musician. You go inside the studio, and you get paid to play and record. Well, I used to play and record for King Tubbies, a great producer as well, Bonnie Lee, and Jamie, Jam, King Jamie was, um, he was um, a young engineer that, those times doing his, his own little thing on the side, a little session now and then. And I played on a song for him. And I haven't seen him for about seven years. So I went there to collect. <laughs> <laughs> and I stumbled on this, in his little studio. And, and he said to us, well, we can start back from here, start to make back music. So at those times, Cleveland used to play with Freddie McGregor Band. And I went to Cleveland and asked him to come with me by King Jamies. And we hooked up and started to make music. That's how we get together. And you all were, I guess you could say, the house band for, for Jamie at that time? You up played till up till now. Up till now. Still, I mean, whenever he has um, 
work to do, so in the work, call us. We'll go in and give him a help. Yeah. During, during the, uh, the mid to late 80s, that was really the heyday of, uh, you know, uh, the, when the sound of dance hall really took off. And I read, I've got a statistic here that is kind of incredible. It says, um, in, from 1985 to 1987, uh, there was an average of 60 of the top 10 songs every year that you guys uh, played on. I mean, that's, that's a, an astounding figure. So many songs. Did you, were you getting paid, if I may ask, by, <laughs> by the session work per uh, session? Well, uh, <laughs> I personally, I think I play on the most hit song out of Jamaica. The most hit song in the history of Jamaica as an individual musician. Yeah, I can endorse that, yes. I mean, I play the most hit song. Most of the song that you hear is I play it from a kid coming up. You don't understand, right? But on the pay side, it was no form, it was no money for us. It was just playing music. We wanted to play music. I mean, and in Jamaica, a man know that, yes, you're willing to play. <laughs> Doesn't consider paying, just play. <laughs> so you keep playing, play, play, play. But by doing that over the years, found out that um, it is something that, um, it is like a school, a college. You keep learning, learning, learning. In music, you never stop learning. Keep learning, learning, learning. And there be no pay. But I mean, you're sitting playing with greats like Tommy McCooks, Sly and Robbie. I mean, that was the pay. You're playing with great people and you learn a lot. So it wasn't really money, it was just music. <laughs> While making the music too, we never focus on the money. Right. Think about making great music first. The money will come after. So of course you guys have worked with just about every vocalist who's, who's come along. Uh, do you have uh, some favorites or uh, ones you particularly like to work with? Were you there? Was the recording process uh, such that you were there when the tracks were being voiced? Or did you uh, lay down the rhythm tracks and then you don't know what happens to them? No, in Jamaica, you, know, you do everything. You make the track. Actually, in Jamaica, really, is really the musician and the engineer is really the producers. I mean, in Many Jamaica, cases, when yes. you go inside a studio, you create the, the track, you get the artist, you write together, make the song, and then the producer came in and said, I produce this song. <laughs> it's not really true, it's just musician and engineer produce most of the song in Jamaica. From Sir Coxon coming down, it's always the band, the other one that um, do all the work. I think we might have pioneered a change in the culture too, because even in creating, composing the music, many times you compose the music and the credits come out wrong. You might see the producer's name as the writer. Mm. You know, and, um, <laughs> I think the producers hated us when we started demanding a change to that culture. And that pushed us to start producing ourselves mm -hmm. and putting the right credits, giving the credits to the, 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 the authors, you know, and um, if there is any ad additional musician that might have um, uh, co-composed the, the, the tracks with us, we would give them credit mm. on that, which they were happy for, because many of the producers they worked for before did not give them any credit. Sure, yeah, I think that, that must have been a very uh, unusual situation when you started doing it. If you look at the older recordings, uh, to use Studio One again as an example, you'll see, you know, uh, Cox and Dodd is credited as the writer exactly. for all those, all those songs. And as far as I know, he was not a musician, um, and maybe someone, Jackie Mattu, or someone like that might have written. Yes, and, he, and most of the session he's not there. I mean, might be the keyboard player, 
at, at the session that day. Might be the basement of the session that day. <laughs> yeah. But there's no, it's, it's they own the master. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, but, the yeah. rightful part of that is what you call, um, what you call it? Producer um, mentioned, what you call it? Oh, the executive director. The executive, the executive producer. producer, really. And being credited as a producer, but mm -hmm. not. Is uh, the musician and the artist really make the music in Jamaica? So during that time, and we see and brighter days yeah. now. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks to you guys, have been changing things. <laughs> yeah, it does change. Yeah. But during that during that time in the the mid to <laughs> late eighties, um, what was the what was the vibes like at the studio there at Jammies? Because it was just hit after hit after hit. I mean, you know, everything Foxy Brown, Sorry, uh, on, onwards. Um, those days, like, I will, I will get up like, because Jamaica, as I say, is a choppy country, sunny and nice, not very cold right now. <laughs> and I might get up five in the morning, and I call Cleve and say, I have an idea. Let's go to the studio. Run off to the studio. 7.30, we are there. Knocking on Jamie's door, get up. Work to do. Get up, turn on the machine, start to make music. By the time it go midday, all the artists will come inside and they'll start to pen, start to write, create ideas. So as I said, it was a free spirit thing. That's what created the music. You, music is not something you can give yourself to restrict it like bond, bondage. It's a free spirit. You have to be free. Make music. And at that time um, is when we saw the, 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 um, the making of many of the artists that are successful today. We went in not knowing what would have become of those songs nor those artists. Mm -hmm. Being a new music form, you know, dance hall, mm -hmm. um, Shabarang, Super, Astro, Lieutenant, Stitchy, Super Cat, you know, all, all the artists that have made a name for themselves today. So it was a period when we saw the making of the artists we experienced and we worked along with them. When, when the, you were speaking about the, the singers who would come in and begin to pen their lyrics, etc., how would, how would one person get the chance to actually stand up and voice song? How do you choose, you know, one person say, I got a song, I got a song, you know? As I said, it's all vibes. You're there, you play the idea to an artist. It might be a room full of artists. And one might say, I think I found a song for the rhythm. Comes out, I start to sing, or a DJ, you listen. And it, I mean, it's, it's something that you have to have an ear for it. Mm. <laughs> yes, you can know it, you can hear from a distance, what it is like. That time it was the beginning of the downsizing of studios. Right. You know, started down. So um, when we made the tracks, we could just open the door. It was one room. We actually voiced in the same recording room. Oh, yeah. 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 And um, you opened the door and turned up the track. So you so didn't all have the artists a vocal outside booth? outside started uh, writing. Uh, <laughs> you know? There was you know, no booth. No booth. No. <laughs> you have to use your, your earphones. But one thing I can say, stood right in, front of in Jamaica, we try to use the best equipment, most expensive equipment. A kind of work out Nice gate, something you have to use. Like um, make up back for a thing that lasts. <laughs> mm. We don't have a, a, a boot for vo vocal, we get a Nyman mic. <laughs> you know, we have to replace back something for something. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I say, Jamaica is a little place, and those times, in those days, you have to be very inventful, you know? Create, be creative. The studio um, was that. Find a um, way to Jamis go around home. things to make it happen. That was actually Jamie's home, where the studio was. Yeah. So Jamie was there most of the time. Was he. No. No? No. no. He would just bring in the tapes <laughs> and say, um, make five rhythms today. And he left. Then he came back and said, hey, <laughs> let me hear the five rhythms. I mean, <laughs> I used to make 60 track a night. 60. Yeah. 
playing, 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 playing. Come quick, come quick, come quick, come quick, come quick. I find a groove. You understand? <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> you understand? Six, <laughs> Sixty rhythm a night. Keep playing, playing, grooving, grooving. I mean, when, when you are sleeping, we are up playing, 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 playing. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was there. We found out many of the hit songs out of Jamaica also were recorded that way. Where the, 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 the as we said, the first cut is the deepest. You know, sometimes I'm even in the jamming studio, um, the vocalist standing right before you and voicing. It came Same out with a different feel. You know, when you go into a booth, it just changes. And um, we just worked with it. I mean, it worked. Yeah. So that was the, the scratch vocal track or just... Yes, yes. that was a demo yeah. and it's properly voiced. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was standing there singing and we were playing and record that. Yeah, while the track is going down and you have a vocal, you can get some great cuts that way. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody in unison. Yeah, and, and, and yet a lot of the tracks then were also revoiced again. I mean, not, not that one. But, uh, you know, you guys brought back, like, for example, the taxi uh, rhythm, yeah, which I mean, became really popular. Many yeah. people voiced on that We used voicing one. to the proper way, like the voice boat, to voice. But what we are saying now is that sometime at that moment, that time and space right there, you will never get that again. It's going to be there and then, no other time. You have to capture it there. Sometimes yeah. you might fix a little here and there, but sometimes what you capture there and there, you keep it, you don't, don't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. hmm. If it's really bad, get rid of it. <laughs> I mean, what say, it, sometimes there are songs that come in a special way, you know? Some, a way that you didn't expect it, like that one. I saw outside the studio, we passing by a way, I stopped and said, Don, I'm looking for you for many years now. She said, Oh, yes, and my name is Steele. I introduced myself. And I told her that the first time I'm playing keyboards, that was actually the first song I learned to play on a keyboard. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to, do it, to recover it back. I was still craving. But it has a funny chord to play that inch you go. Hold on. That chord is always a funny chord in my ears. I said to Cleve, I need to record a song. So I saw her passing by and stopped her and said, let me record a song for you again, no? in modern times. She agreed. I mean, on the street, and then she come inside the studio. I would start, no, no, no. Let's make it. Mm. I mean, that's the same vibe to stop her there, give her the mic, and she sang. That's it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I'd like to uh, talk to Cleve a little bit about the drum programming because uh, it's, it's very easy to make a, a stiff rhythm with a drum machine, but it's really difficult to make a good swinging this, rhythm this is the, the way that this man does. The and master. We should have a live drum here. A yeah. drum machine, let me show you. Well, maybe, we can, maybe we can get into the <laughs> studio in a minute. But uh, is there any advice you can give uh, all of us today? I think there's a lot of people who are interested in programming drums here. It really helps if you have some knowledge of the instrument. I mean, as a programmer, if you're programming, it's good to understand. Um, even, for instance, when you hit harder, what happens when you hit harder, when you hit soft? Oh, the skin stretches and the, the, the pitch changes and so and then um, what you put into your programming is what you get out. So if you want it to sound real, you have to analyze every beat. What would you play live you know, if you were going to do this live? 
um, if you don't want it to sound live, then you're free to program, you know, whatever. Yeah, but if you want a program to sound live, you have to analyze every bit of it. We, for instance, um, will stop the hi -hats when you have a fill, because I'm not an octopus. You know, so, <laughs> so um, you know, it helps um, to have some knowledge of the real instrument and knowledge of music. How about your samples, uh, or how do you get the drum sounds? Um, at times, I'll take a drum kit into the studio. Or different sneers and sample my own sounds. You know, you get sounds from here, there, everywhere, bringing steely, steely, or some weird EQs and so. So, I have a large catalog basically of sounds mm -hmm. um, from old stuff from the old studio one. So, because I also worked for Coxon mm -hmm. for some time at Studio One. You know, so um, I discovered how he mic the drum kit and I tried some of that miking myself. At times, the bass drum mic isn't inside the back, it's around the front. Mm. Real unorthodox methods. And um, I try to recapture you know, for certain applications. Um, the way you swing, again, the, the, the quantize is quite important. Um, there are tracks that I might do and even vary the tempo a bit. To vary the tempo? Yes. Like that, to make it that, feel that, that, that song, no, no, no. Yeah. We cannot yeah. play it back because that tempo vary. Because the drum machine go fast at time, slow at time. And it was just recorded. You no, changed it. You had changed no that time song, code. Yeah. There was no time code. So, no time code. You know, we just ran the drum machine and where we felt like it should drift. We drift it and take it, it a back. bit, take it back up. So, so how, are you, how are you doing mechanical. that? Turning the, turning yeah, the, the tempo. Oh, shift man. the tempo. So the tempo is more than happy. Yeah. And after play, keep watching the clear swing, go so fast. The velocity on you, you know, the way you play. Coming I mean, back slow. He played the bass line straight through. Yeah. It wasn't sequenced. <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes we, for reggae, we want to keep feel in the music. Even for dance or whatever, I mean, our um, view is that we should keep the human element as well. Keep some feel in it. Mm -hmm. We mix up sounds sometimes, like that uh, 808 hi hat mixed up with, you know, we just mix and combine our sort of sounds. But we hear this, the finished product in our heads mm -hmm. sometimes, and somehow Steely and I, we hear the same thing. Yeah. It's as if we're connected. <laughs> yeah. And you know, he will say, yes, that's the sound he was hearing. Uh, the same sound that I might go for. And sometimes nothing else would work. I mean, you know, you just, there's a certain sound that you just have to get for a particular sound. When you make a chat, you have to, um, you have to choose carefully what it was sound. I mean, the, 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 the dance that you're talking about now with some more computerized, it's like kids just, they just put in a drum kit, put in sounds together, and, and, make just, a beat. and just make a beat. No, we don't do it like that. We, we choose sounds, because it's not every kick drum works with a snare. It's not every snare works with an ayat. They have to be together, it's like uniform. You have to listen carefully and choose carefully, put it together, it's like a puzzle and put it in together. Even um, in terms of uh, the, the, the early Jamis recordings, there were some other musicians that sort of copied our style and tried to get samples from other producers of our sounds and so. But many times, the big difference was um, the pitch, the tuning of the drums. Mm. They'll take the sounds and make a new song different song in a different key. I, well, based on my, my knowledge of, um, I, I read music as well, um, I understood pitch, you know, where some percussionists, they just use the sound. I you would go for like the dominant, the, the, for each percussive sound, there's a dominant note there on the snare, you know, on the kick, you know, if you tune in, you can hear it. You know, and um, I will put it in tune to the song. Mm -hmm. My drums were tuned to the song. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was easy with the drum machine. I mean, you could just pitch. The cream, I said, give me a G, and I go. Yeah. And 
tune the kick drum to that note. Although it's a short percussive sound, right. if you listen, you'll hear that mm -hmm. here is a dominant pitch. So you would so tune... So it sounds like a yeah. packaged product mm -hmm. yeah, that was somehow different. And nobody could figure out how we can get our sound in the charts. We weren't supportive of Piola. We're not into that. I mean, to this day, we don't believe in Piola. You know, it must be a level play field. Let the people decide. Mm -hmm. If they really like a song, you go out and buy it. And it's the little details. Yes, the little details made a difference. Made a huge difference. Like tuning the drums. Like tuning the drums. Yeah, that's good. There were some artists that um, came about that were DJs. And the difference with Jamaican DJs is different from rap. We find that um, we use a lot of melodies. The DJs had to be in a certain key or whatever. You had to use the melodies right. But um, we found that there were some that couldn't find the right key. So we started making uh, music like When, you know, where it was more percussive based. You know, not much keyboards. I used abstract cards and so, and just created a beat. That was a new thing again, where we allowed those artists to express themselves without it sounding off-key. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we still kept it musical. And the first song we did like that um, by Tiger, the artist called Tiger, called When, was awarded Song of the Year in Jamaica, the Jamie Awards. Yeah. And that song took us half an hour to record. One of the fastest recordings we ever did. Mm. The track went on in half an hour. The song was written there, one hour total recorded song of the year in 1990. So uh, Clevy is also the chairman of the Recording Industry Association of Jamaica and I was wondering if you could tell us you know what are some of the issues that uh, you're concerned about uh, these days. You, you mentioned something that I think is really interesting which is the archiving of, of uh, Jamaican music and uh, when we were speaking about this earlier, you said some of these master tapes, who knows, <laughs> erased. Yeah. where are they, or, they're, or they've been erased. Yeah, and um, even some of the old studio and stuff. I'm not quite sure now where those are, because um, Sir Cox and Dad passed away last year, and um, I'm not quite sure now. But the Recording Industry Association of Jamaica, um, we've discovered as technology came into our homes that music sales declined due to um, piracy, for one, and um, there were a lot of sites offering our music mm. without being um, a, a legitimate um, provider. So we decided to come together you know, and where we could um, lobby, you know, for instance, for changes. Um, we have some like, old copyright law that need amendments and so but we are no different from the RIAA, you know, and um, we are a young association, just two years old, which we hope to, um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, of course, you know, there are so many predecessors of associations, like there's the BPI, you know, RIAA for one, <clears throat> which we can learn from. So, in the long run, basically the issues are the same, but piracy is the main thing affecting our industry now in Jamaica. Music sales have declined tremendously. Mm. You know, so um, we, we have embarked on public education because many of the youths now that are supporting the pirates are not aware of the, the effects it has on the industry. So we have started from the schools, basically, because uh, many of the schools, you have kids even starting a business now where they're providing songs to <laughs> the other students. You know, it's happening with um, movies as well, you know, a lot of movies that are not even released on DVD are available in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So um, we have also come together with other interests that have intellectual property to, to protect and started an anti-piracy alliance, which is also a recent um, development. So we're working to save the music in Jamaica, you know, working hard on that. Yeah, um, I just want to ask a question. Um, obviously, obviously, you guys have played so many different groups for wicked artists in the history of your country's music. 
but I wanted to know um, a bit more about how you came up with so much inspiration to create the grooves. Um, I know the writers were there and stuff, but could you tell us about the process of collaboration in the studio with the producers and what you were thinking of, what inspired you to write those kind of melodies and rhythms? Mm -hmm. well, first of all, our level of music appreciation is vast. We listen to everything. Listen to classical, I listen to everything. And Jamaica, as I say, are being multiracial. Our music comes from all over the world, different places, and we just try to tap into everything. If I'm to produce a classical act, I can do it. I'll do it, I'll give it a try. But sometimes um, we fuse things as well. Influences come from all around. Like this? Uh. All type of music. <laughs> <laughs> That's an idea. Now, one, of, one of the things that, that always surprised me is uh, how many Jamaicans love country music, you know, American, yeah, yeah. country, and Western. <laughs> yeah, you Someone know. Loves You, Honey was a big hit. Um, yeah. From Jason yeah. Dodge. We had um, Kenny Rogers two months ago there. Yeah. Where, I think he was shocked when he saw the response and people singing his songs. He didn't expect that. Mm. You know. But we listen to all types of music in Jamaica. Yes. You know, small country, you know, 2.5 million people. But you'd be surprised the, the, the music we know. We know <laughs> everything. <laughs> I truly believe that our music is a, like a melting pot of influences. And our motto, out of many, one people. Um, I would say out of many music forms, there's one music. So reggae is that melting pot of all cultures, of all sorts of fusions. So it's just the degree of what influence you put into it that makes the difference, the overall thing. Um, for instance, on some dance or tracks, we will use strings, which was you know, not an instrument that you would want to put into dance hall, because dance hall was so hard. We introduced strings and so um, Street Sweeper, for instance. Garnet Silk. Garnet Silk. Um, Love is the answer. You want to play that? Yeah, man. Track three. The last one. Not so, yeah. No. Continue to send. Um, Love is the answer. Yeah. The great Garnet Silk, by the way, uh, was uh, a singer that I guess you all gave his start yes. back uh, in uh, 90, maybe? Yes, um, Steele actually gave him the name Garnet Silk. He gave him so, that name? Yes, right. So Great. he launched his career. So. Im Im important, very important uh, singer to check out. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, I want to know about sound system, as in uh, street sound system. Like, I think back in the 70s, there used to be like sound system. There used to be the best way for producers to break their own records. There used to be like, like four different sound system competing every every week or something. Is it still as big now as what it used to be? Or how does it work now to break your record? Is that a radio? Or how is it now? Okay. That's uh, another love um, that Steely had, I, um, which was affecting our production. I took him out of it. Steely <laughs> is the owner of one of Jamaica's most popular sound systems, Silverhawk, you know, and was tearing up the scene. Started out as a small sound system and just blew up to be one of the top sound systems in Jamaica. But um, sound systems played a part in um, promoting your music as well. You know, um, you know, Take, take it from there. Yes, um, it is, as, as I said, it is not like before. Sound system was a day, back in the days, where you need to find something new, what's coming out new as a new songs. You used to go by the sound, the dances, and listen to what plays. Now, it's, as I said, it's radio and sound. It is not like what we had before. All that has passed is most radio, sometimes sound are in a club, but it's not sound system anymore, like what, what, what it was before. Those days, 
long gone. Mm -hmm. Laws have been passed to um, where um, like noise pollution laws and so back in the days you could hear sound systems from miles away where they used to put like steel horns up in the top of trees to pull crowds from yeah, miles they, around. 20 yeah. miles in here, this, we that can't sound do that in the air and you don't know, you don't know where the sound coming, you just trail that sound. Just follow the sound. Follow the sound. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that anymore, so can't things have anymore. changed a bit. But it was all part of the vibe, you know, and we have lost that, so it's more like clubs now. So what's up with the dub? Are you still making dub records? Or what's yeah, occasionally we make it because, I mean, different parts of the world ask for different music. I mean, like in Japan now, we have a market there for reggae, and um, it's more like deep dancehall and um, a jungle type of reggae that I'm into. But this is like for Europe, mostly like England and Germany and France, we gravitate to this sort of thing here. And um, most of the younger producers coming up making dancehall now, which I don't make dub dancehall. So it's a different. It's but not even don't. It's not even don't make. But I don't think they know how to do it, <laughs> really. <laughs> As it's, they say, the the base of the music. They are, I think most kids nowadays don't interested in knowing the base of the music. It's all just computer and jump machine and technology. But as people said before, you have to know music from the bass. You have to know a live instrument. What does it feel like to play an instrument? <coughs> that will guide you to making proper music, whether it's in Even in terms of your EQs and so, when you understand the instrument itself, you know? Okay. Um, most of the young producers just hear samples. They have never stood up beside a saxophonist and listen to the timbre of the sound. And so you don't know how to really EQ. You know? So it's a whole different experience now. I just have a question building off what we were just talking about there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about the feel of the music and how important it is, love, how important love is in reggae music. And maybe some days when you're in the studio and that, that vibe isn't there and you're not feeling it. And what, what are some of the things you could do or some of the things that work well that you get that good vibe back in the room and you can start making music. Maybe when the engineers and the musicians are all there, but the feeling is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, what we usually do, we walk away. We go to the beach. <laughs> wash, wash away the bad vibes. Wash away the bad vibes. Yeah. <laughs> Drink a water jelly and come back. If it's not there, we go to the river. <laughs> come back. It will eventually come back and correct itself. But as you're saying, some days you have a bad vibe, some days you have a good vibes. And when it's not, when it's not there, it's, it's how you as an individual put yourself in a mind, you know, mindset. So yes, I have to do this, or I don't have to, or I need to do this. But I mean, it's not every day is a bad day. It will come back. That day will pass and it will come back to you. As a producer, though, you, um, if you are working with other musicians, you have to be selective as well. You have to choose the right person for the job. Personality. Um, we know in Jamaica, I mean, <laughs> the industry, there are a lot of musicians smoke weed, for instance. You have musicians that drink alcohol. There's a difference. We can play a song and know which musician yeah, we, we, we can play a song the, and know which is the weed man and who is the alcohol and who is man. the wine man. You <laughs> can play it and I can, you I, can feel it. You know? I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play, but I'm gonna play um, the wine man. <laughs> <laughs> the wine man is very. Is, we'll the, say. is there any sad reggae music? Sad reggae music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes, lad. Yes. Yes. Um, this 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 is a wine man, classic. Yes, weed. <laughs> 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 but we have we have deep 
we are very, very, very deep. Deep with some deep. <laughs> deep. <laughs> it's, um, it's a behavior. Um, when you drink and you feel wineish, you play happy music. Same side. When you when you smoke, you play high music. <laughs> Different level. You're in space. <laughs> so we can tell from the musician type of yeah, the final feel you want from a sound you select. <laughs> there, in the early days, though, like um, there were some sessions. You walk into the session and you don't see anybody. It's just smoke. <laughs> so <laughs> all those who are like, like musicians, like a bunch of session. musicians, you, know, you walk in. The they room. have no choice. You have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But things have changed, though. We're um, we have brought in professionals to build the studios now, and they recommend that no smoking in the rooms. So things have changed where you don't smoke in studios anymore. Yeah. <laughs> damage, you damage the equipment. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and, and this, this is another weed song, it's a Peter Touch. Weed and wine combination. Uh, uh, yeah. If you have it. Uh, weed and wine combination. <laughs> <laughs> Try to find a weed and wine combination. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> weed and wine combination. Mm -hmm. I, th I think so. You think you have one? <laughs> but that might be later in the studio session. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> no, that's all. <over. laughs> Can we get another question while you're looking for the weed and wine too? <laughs> I wanted to go back to a question that was asked before. It might sound like a bit of a vague question. How do you make it sound so good? But we need to go back to that because some of the records that you're playing might be 25, 30 years old. But if you play them on a set now next to a record that was made yesterday in some multi-million pound studio, it still blows it out, it blows it out of the water, you know, and um, I just wanted to ask you, as a producer, you know, when it comes to bass and frequency, is it, is it a science? What is the secret? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. Many times things in Jamaica, as Steele said earlier, don't work the right way. Sometimes, um, you might fix a, a piece of equipment and just the error creates something new. Um, we also have some um, self-taught, brilliant engineers. Engineers that are just great. I mean, inborn uh, talent Kibbe, or something. There's one track. I'm going to play a track, the same as people trying to explain. This is in a live session, playing Sly and Rabbi. While playing, the mic, the Ayat mic went out, so the, the tambourine man has to take the lead. This is it. <laughs> so, it's frequency. Forget it, but I understand where you're coming from. To get it this way, you have to know, serious, you have to know the dynamic range of instrument. If you play a, a piano, you have to know what acoustic piano really sound like to the ear. Then you have to get it as close as possible through a mic. If you play a bass, you have to know what a bass sound like. Within the ears, you have to do the same. So it's all being a good engineer and have good ears for music and range of instrument. You have to know the pitch of instrument, what it sound like being real. And, um, I mean, there's a little creative part of that, too, where you have to invent your own char character of sound, create it, where you, you put it the way you want to hear it. But you cannot take it much too far away from the origin. So it's, it's a kind of frequency where you have to know what sound real. It's like your eyes. If you just see someone with your eyes, and um, you buy a camera to take that picture. And by taking the picture, it, it looks like the person, <laughs> but it's a different, when you see it with your eyes, 
So as you go closer in technology, maybe the, it gets closer to the person as what I see, but not really. Is you, are, you need to get it as real as what the I see. So that day when they come with a camera that can show you what the eyes see, that would be a camera, really. So as I'm trying to explain, everything as a state at, it, at its base, what it is, for it to be real. You cannot change it. It has to stay in its, its own form. That's how you get the sound, for it to sound good. So if you get an expensive student now, and it's all expensive equipment, but it is giving a different sound from what it is. It will not sound like this stuff. I mean, it doesn't matter how much money you spend. It doesn't matter. You have to capture what is there for it to be real. You see, a lot of the bass players also, um, they use tube amplifiers. You know, um, a lot of the music we use tube. Tube had that certain sound to it. And then each bass player, still said, would um, create his own sound. And many times he would mic the amplifier, mic the speaker, instead of a direct feed. You know, so partially it's a sound created by the individual bass player. I can't tell you the frequencies they use, but the engineer just reproduced that. And I think most of the students in Jamaica, in, back in the days, <laughs> as I said, so, um, most things don't, don't work, but when, we, when I really think and go back in time, I realize that they're using very expensive equipment, yeah. such as Neve. Most of the students in Jamaica, Jamaica use Neve board. Those days. Yeah. Those days. <coughs> it's all expensive equipment that we'll find now. now. If we try to purchase it, um, buy them now. They're very expensive. So, as I say, it is good equipment. Jamaica has always used the best. And that's it, just good equipment. That gives you the sound. I mean, and it's, it's like what student is now today is not the same as it was the, those days. It was all these big, huge rooms with a lot of things, mics and the real thing. Real thing. Not plugins, real thing. Not plugins, real thing. So, I mean, <laughs> can't be the same. Can't be. I don't know how to explain it. But yeah, just keep it real. That's it. As I say, if you can project what I see on a camera, that's the camera. So it's the same in sound. You, you, you project what you hear. If a guitar play pong, and that's the way it sounds, that's what you record. You do not go and try to let it sound, make it sound like another guitar. You have to take it as how it sounds on that guitar. That's its, it's origin, that's its dynamic sound. That's what the reggae bass are, bass are from, being real, real. You're playing, while you're playing, someone talking to you, the like one I said, give me a drink. <coughs> Yes, son? That's how the reggae make. Real. Real music. <laughs> it's not something you plan and go. No. It's real music. I, 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 I play, a, <laughs> in most reggae songs, what they, 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 you might play a wrong note, as they call it. What call it, clear? Incidental. Incidental note, a wrong note. <laughs> That's it. By a man playing this, I might play this. <laughs> you understand? Just real, just play music. And mo most, of the, <laughs> most of the early hits all had a wrong note that we just left it like that. Yeah. Because yeah. you capture a moment. It's not like, it's like those so, days of recordings, <laughs> I mean, it happened once and you capture the moment. It wasn't sequenced. You just, you this, this was a little song that they were doing. Don't take it for a joke. This is not a joke, listen to this. Oh, <laughs> someone walked into the studio. <laughs> someone walked into the studio, that man said, like, cut! What's the name of that <laughs> Break fast in bed. Sorry? Draw your brakes. But, um, they, Draw uh, your brakes. Draw your brakes. Yeah. <laughs> Scotty. 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 Yeah. Julie 
Uh, uh, the original went on the British chart. The singer, the singing one. Breakfast in bed. Lana La Bennett. Yeah. Yeah? Ah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, that is Jamaica. I mean, I remember I went to a Bob Marlin Whalers, Bonnie Whalers session. It took me 15 minutes to find the room. It was all smokes. Challenge. Dark. It was like fog. It was. <laughs> Just musician. Play. So reggae music, it, as I said before earlier, and it has a deep thing about it. It is not about great things and overdoing things. It's just being real. Keep it real. Anyone. I can make you play it right now and play it as well as me. Same. It is simple. It is about being yourself. That's all it is. Being yourself. That's how it sounds great. Being yourself. All right. Good advice. Anybody else uh, out there? Um, you said this thing earlier about um, if it's real music, you can't. No machine in the world can't any take anything away from it. But nevertheless, you had some sort of a role in introducing digital drum machines and stuff. What were the ones that you really liked to work with that gave you the way to be human? Well, clearly, it's um, it's anything. Once we know how to program a drum machine, <laughs> we can use it. But our, our um, drum machine we use in the past is a DX. Mm -hmm. DX on J Ob DX. Oberheim. Oberheim. We started out using our Oberheim. Um, but it was built in Germany. Chips, not you had to mm. move the chips. Or no floppy, yes. nothing like that. We used to get our chip burn in England, special chips. They put in the slot, special sound. And we use uh, XPX 1200. Later down, we use uh, 3000. Akai. Akai 3000, MPC. Um, but basically, we like the DX machine and the 12, XPX 1200. It's, it sounded good more than all the rest of the drum machine. Those two sounded the best. And um, as I had said earlier, during that transitional period, we found that um, there were producers coming up that, um, for e economical reasons, eh, um, couldn't afford the big studios, and um, some of them set up studios out of their homes, and um, it was easier, it took less time um, using a drum machine. You know, um, as I said earlier, I would be one hour kicking the bass drum for the engineer to get the sound right, and so, so it took more, much more time. So, for those reasons, I think um, the whole thing caught on where producers could afford to, to um, record sounds. And who out of the new kids that are currently ruling Jamaica sounds do you rate? Oh, could you repeat? Who of the new wave of producers that currently are doing music in Jamaica, who do you rate? Who do you like there? New wave of producers, who do you rate? Like new? Mm -hmm. oh. uh, there's... Um, Oh, there's a few, few, few. I mean, um, we are from the old school, and if you're not, I don't know what I say. You, you have to come in from the tradition school for it to really, really impress us as new producer. And the only one that we see now is like Dave Kelly, Cleary Brothers, Danny Brownie. Um, Colin Fatter, um, Colin Fatties, yeah. um, Bald Bay. There are a few there, not a lot. I mean, as I said, the new kids now, they are into machine, only machine, not music, machine. So it, it's not like specialists in that area. Yeah, but they are to that, analyze yeah. from that aspect. But the one that we see, um, is in the right line, as I mentioned before, there's Dave Kelly, Colin Fat, and um, Dan Carleon, yes, Dana Brownie, few, not much. How do you feel about more traditional sounding rhythms coming back now and being like very prominent? 
the more traditional music coming back from I feel about Yes, it is good, but the difference is that it is a tradition um, form of playing, but not the sound. I mean, it's, it's still young kids trying to play the music, and um, most of the kids have no, have no um, experience. Like, if I to say to a young engineer now in Jamaica, I need you to record a live kick jump for me. <laughs> we'll have a big problem. Because they're accustomed to just plugging into a drum machine or a model. So if you were to mic a drum kit now, they're lost. You know, a lot of the young engineers are not really sure <laughs> how to EQ the sound, where to place the mic, the right choice of mics. Um, you hear the difference when you compare, when you do the comparison. But I mean, we don't have to do the comparison. We, we know the difference. But there is a difference. And um, as I had said earlier, the, the, if you're going back to that old sound, you have to understand the spirit of the time you know, to really capture that feel. But I mean, they're making songs that are working. I mean, the generation that didn't know what it's coming from, accept it as it is for what it is. So it's still good, you know. But because we are from the old school, we know what it's supposed to be, you know, and it hasn't really hit the mark. Do you have kids working with you that you teach and that you try to bring in on it? Yes, um, and, it, and as I was going to say now, it, it still it depends on the individual. I mean, when we were a kid, we used to go by the studio days nothing to eat, nothing, no sleep. Just inside the studio, want to learn, want to learn. Mm -hmm. Watch other um, experienced players playing, engineer, look, listen, sleep, wait the next morning in the studio, watching. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could remember one day I passed a, a, a studio and I saw lights, and when I went there, it was Chris Blackwell and Jimmy Cliff making a song. And I stopped there for three days, no food, just there. You yeah, understand? So we'll find a few kids now like that in Jamaica, a few that have the same drive. And when, when we see them, we always encourage them to come aboard, teach them what we know. Many. But most of the kids, after you teach them, and they think they learn a lot, they, went, they go on their own, like, Leave the nest <laughs> without the honey. <laughs> you understand? But there's a few that stay within the range and keep learning and learning. Just a few, not a lot. You have to put time into it. You have to spend time, learn your instrument, learn the business as well. It doesn't make sense you're in the music business and you don't know the business. It's important. So we'll try to encourage the um, the upcoming producers, artists, and so to learn the business <laughs> of music. Time has changed. I remember me and Cleve as a kid again, go to Sir Cox and Studio One and play 200 songs. <laughs> and we saw a check for $20. <laughs> and we say, Coxon, what is this? And he say, you get paid to learn. <laughs> so it was like a school. <laughs> You're in the like school. You cannot pay for it. I say, okay, boss. <laughs> Just keep going. You understand? The kids nowadays, no, they're not interesting. I mean, it's a growing process where you take it day by day, step by step. The younger kids, that mind is not there. They need to just calm and follow the music. Follow the music. And it will work. You need to just get that principle with yourself and follow the music. And it will guide you, I'm sure. It will guide you. All right. Thanks very much for coming and sharing this information and your knowledge mm. with us. And uh, we we'll hope to uh, see you around for a few minutes afterwards. Uh, if anyone has anything else they'd like to talk about, Steely and Cleavy, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>